Hi, I'm Madhivanan Rajendran and welcome to Human Factors International's Meet the Authors Conversation. With me today I have Dr. Eric Schaefer, the CEO and founder of HFI, and Apala Lehri, the Global Chief of Technical Staff at HFI, who also co-authored the book, Institutionalization of UX, a step-by-step -step guide to user experience practice, which is a major update to Dr. Schaefer's groundbreaking book, Institutionalization of Usability, a step-by-step -step guide. Published by Addison Wesley, praise for the new book is pouring in. Recent quotes include, this handy book should be required reading for any executive champions of change in any development organization making products that demand a compelling user experience. Also, if you're tasked with building a user experience practice in a large organization, this book is for you and your boss. And here is a wonderful guide for all who wish to make usability a way of life for their companies. It's been almost 10 years since you wrote uh, your book, Institutionalization of Usability. Uh, what has changed to motivate you to write this new edition? You know, it's interesting. The technology has moved a lot. We have all kinds of gesture interfaces and ubiquitous computing, and computing is going much more global and into emerging markets. All this stuff is going on. And yet, the core user experience practice is very much the same because we engineer human beings. The technology makes a few changes, but the real sea change is the demand to do large-scale user experience work. So I see many organizations starting to succeed. We have a number of organizations that we've certified at level five. They have enough user experience folks to do the work. They're doing it in a serious, mature way, and that's exciting. We see other organizations that are real laggards. So you'll see organizations that need to have 30,000 UX people because they're enormous. And they have 65. It's like, what are you supposed to do with that? Right? You have organizations that are doing UX in a very ad hoc way. They hire a bunch of people, and those people run from room to room trying to do UX, whatever that means, and they haven't even defined it. So, we're seeing a shift now to organizations doing it really seriously on a large scale and serious way. And that's requiring a lot of shifts. If, if you look at the shift, it's a lot about scaling up. Now we're talking about, for example, object-oriented UX, where we do the work differently so that we can scale and take advantage of the knowledge shared within the organization. So we don't have to re-research things all the time, and we can compile the knowledge of the user's ecosystem without, without having to uh, redo the research every single time. So we're working with global organizations, and you have to operate remotely. So how do you do that? And so the book answers those kinds of questions. So how do you do it on a large scale? How do you integrate it into an organization? As far as collaboration goes, it was, you know, it was an interesting process because Eric, when he told me about the chapter that, you know, uh, it would be interesting to include this chapter, we talked a lot about what would we write about? What is it that would be really useful? And um, uh, in the discussion, it emerged that there really wasn't a practical process that was out there for companies to use in terms of, you know, localizing products. And so Eric was uh, very keen that we think about that, that I should come up with a method that could be used by people. So, you know, enough theory has been written. So now how about writing, uh, uh, putting together a practical method that people could use and explaining that, writing about that in the book. So we discussed, we went back and forth discussing about this process, etc. So um, I think it was that collaboration really helped clarify for me the entire process and you know sort of tweaking it etc you know I, I think i think the core question was this that i mean think about it for a minute you're an organization and you have operations in maybe 120 countries and you're going to build an app now how do you manage that i just could build one app and send it out and hope it works well even if i translate the language and translate the 
the uh, date and all of that, all, all the formats. Even if I do the basic stuff, mm. it's not going to work. It needs to be localized to the culture. And we have so many examples of organizations that make large investments and turn out a, a product into emerging markets, into various different kinds of markets, and are embarrassed because it just works so badly. And you know, the, the thing is that if you had asked me this question, say a decade ago, I'm not sure I would have had a definitive answer. I mean, I would have still said that it's very, very important to be aware of cultural differences and to factor that into design because, well, simply because users have the right to be understood and to be given products and services that really fit their ecosystem, their culture. But I wouldn't have had a solid business case. But what has changed? Something major has changed, and I'll tell you what. Very recently, McKinsey, the consulting company, McKinsey had a report which talked about the emerging markets. They say that by 2025, the total consumption figure across all the emerging countries is going to be 30 trillion US dollars. And they go on to say, this is the biggest ever growth opportunity in the history of capitalism. So that's right there lies the business case. That now you have all these emerging countries. They're not just, you know, like a group of similar countries. They're so diverse that it becomes imperative to understand how users who form the population of this diverse set of countries, how do they really, uh, you know, how do they think about using products and services, digital products and services? But surely we don't think that one design is going to work for all of them. So that's why it's very important now to make sure that there's a mature process and a cost-effective process that is yeah, practical. I think that's the thing. Mm. So it's, it's clearly understood you need to localize. But how do you do that on an industrial scale? Now we're going to have not one app, but we're going to have maybe 50 or 100 new applications every year. Mm -hmm. And what do I do? Do I send a team to 120 countries to gather data? Do I uh, have people from 120 countries come in and try to make that work? What's the right practice? What's the best practice for managing that kind of situation? So that was really the challenge that, that I brought to Apollo. Right. And so in this book, this chapter talks about a solution. Okay. How can you really design for this diverse set of emerging countries and participate in the biggest growth in the history of capitalism without having to send people out to 120 countries and spend, you know, huge amounts of money and complexity in managing all of that and then coming up with the design? How do you manage to do in an easy and practical way and yet design really optimum products? So that chapter covers this very interesting solution that we've come up with. People for years in our field, they've been working to find a magic blue pill. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants a blue pill. There's no magic solution. You need to do the work and it's hard work. It's hard work to understand the user. It's hard work to understand a cultural ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it's hard work to figure out the approach to it, build it, figure out the structure, sweat the details, test and validate that it works. That, that's not a trivial process, but we do know how to do it. And the interesting thing, and this is important, when you do it in a mature operation, it's faster, cheaper, and better. So people try to make UX cheaper, and that's fine. We want it to be cheaper, mm -hmm. but they try to make it cheaper by doing a halfway job, by doing a lean job, by taking baby steps. That's the way to make it cheaper. Mm -hmm. mm, you can, but there's another way to make it cheaper, and that's what the book talks about. What we're doing is talking about making it cheaper by being mature. So if I have to make up my methodology every time, well, mm -hmm. that takes longer. Oh, yeah. If I don't have templates made so that I can't just copy a, a test protocol and, and modify it, I have to come up from scratch, it takes longer. 
Right? If I have to do the research again because I can't find it because it's in a big pile of reports and I can't just pull up who's the user profile, what do we know about them, what's their emotional schema, do we have that already? It takes longer. So you can do discount UX and, and do a halfway job. You can also do mature UX and that's actually faster, cheaper, and better. So one of the changes that's important is we've started not just making it usable, but dealing with complex cross-channel strategies. We've started needing to be innovative and, and do mature innovation practices. Mm -hmm. We've started needing to apply persuasion engineering principles so that we can engineer things for conversion, not just so that I can do it, but so that I will do it. One of the things that people have asked about a lot is the ROI of usability. And the interesting thing is that usability, if it's done in a mature way, it's free. It actually reduces the overall cost of development because you do so many things that cut development costs. Forget about the fact that it's easy to use, fits in the ecosystem, works for the culture. It means that I fail faster. I do usability testing, so I make sure that I find out it doesn't work before I spend the money of coding it and debugging it and putting it out and having to fix it because people kick it back at me. Right? That alone pays for, for usability. The Royal Bank of Canada ran a study. We put a standard in place. That cut development costs by 10% because they weren't reinventing the wheel. Right? So UX, obviously, it's a key differentiator you need to you need to, to have it in order to, to make that customer experience that's the differentiator today. But it turns out that if you do it in a mature way, it actually is free. So do the ROI calculation on that.